Blog Talk Radio. Mi chiamo Apura Kanu, Apura Kaitnu, Neye Akanpo Nana Song Da, Metinde Ujirapo, Kwesi Ran Mpata Akan, Akwamumai and Maruka Itipi Mu Ojirapo, Ojiramai Mu. Greetings to all Apura Kani, Apura Kaitnu. People meaning Africans, black people today is Akanpo Nana Song Day, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Ranehm Pita Akan. Ojirapo, the Akwamu nation in North America within Ojirama, the purified nation, Akurakani, Akurai Kaitni, people in the Western Hemisphere. Let us say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. We've opened up the chat room. If you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. For those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanfo Nana Som, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Religion on Joda on Monday nights where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion, of Nana Som, first and foremost because we are Akan, secondly because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan ancestral religion, culture, cosmology, ritual practice, and so forth, coming from individuals not only in the Western Hemisphere, but also individuals on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, who have been infected with white pseudo-religion, such as Christianity and Islam and so forth, and white culture in general, and therefore their presentation of Akan ancestral religion has been infected with these fake traditions. So we deal with our ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion, which takes us back to our ancestral origins in the region of ancient Kana, the Khan land, the first land, foremost land, a title of ancient Nubia where our people originated. Some of our people went north and settled Kemet, so-called Egypt. Some remained in Kanat. Some of our people migrated further north into the so-called Near East, established Kanana and Kangi, which later became corrupted to Canaan and Sumer and so forth. But our people, some of our people migrated to these different regions. Some of our people migrated west after the fall of Kemet and northern Kanat reestablished ourselves in the western part of the continent, reestablished the Kana Empire, the Nubian Empire, the Empire of Ghana a couple of thousand years ago. After about a thousand years because of Muslim invasions, some of our people migrated from that region further south, reestablished themselves near the forest belt and savannah regions, reestablished Akana civilization in that region. Hundreds of years later, some of our people were forced from those regions into North, North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Diversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how we ended up in North, Central, South America, and so forth. We maintained our Akan ancestral religion through that forced migration. That's the Akan ancestral religion in South America, in Suriname, for example, it's called Winti, from the Akan term, Quinti. It is called Obia in Jamaica from the Akan term, Obai. It is called Hudu in North America from the Akan term, Undu, which means medicine from roots, trees, plant life. This is where we get root work from and so forth. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, through spirit communication. We also utilize the term Kanche in the Akan language, which also goes back to ancient Kanid and Kemet meaning to utter incantations to bring the spirits forth of the Abosom and Nananom and Samafo, the deities and ancestral spirits. That term Kanche became corrupted into Kanje and Kanje in North America. And later, the whites in our spring assumed we were saying Kanjur. So when we use the terms Kudu and Kanjur, we're talking about Undu and Kanche, terms that we use to describe our ritual practices in the Akan language, as well as the language of ancient Kanit, Kemet for thousands of years. So we've maintained our ancestral religious tradition. On Benada, Abinada Tuesday nights, we have Ujida, meaning purification. On that broadcast, we deal with ancestral religion in general, 
not just the Akan expression, but ancestral religion in general, no matter what form it takes, wherever we exist in the world, whether we're on the continent of Akuraka, Afraikaida, outside, we discuss and examine how our ancestral religious practices impact every aspect of our lives. Ancestral religion, or Nana Som, as we call it, Akurakani, Akuraikani, or African ancestral religion, in essence is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. Ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order and through ritual. We reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus align ourselves with divine order. So the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. We state that ojira, purification, operationalizes not our song. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance. Our culture is Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people, is the divine acceptance, the divine law or love of order, and the divine rejection, the divine hatred of disorder and its purveyors. We accept that which is orderly. We reject that which creates disorder. We seek to align every thought, every intention, and every action, every moment of every day with divine order. We make mistakes legitimate mistakes, we engage the ritual process to incorporate divine law and restore divine balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions so that we can get back on track with executing our divine function and creation while aligning every thought, intention, and action every moment of every day with divine order. This is our culture. It's Afurakani, Afurakani people. This is our ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. So the Ojira broadcast, we deal with purification, purification of concepts, cosmology, ritual practice, understanding the nature and function of the deities and ancestral spirits and so forth of our direct blood circles, understanding how we maintain our ancestral religious traditions in our blood circles, even into the forced migration. So it is an intergenerational, transcarnational inheritance. We are born with the Abosom Orisha Vodou in our blood circles, they are assigned to us pre-incarnation by Nyamewa, Nyame, the great mother and great father, supreme being. No one outside of our direct ancestral blood circle can give us our ancestral religion. That is something we are born with and we carry with wherever we exist in the world. We maintained our ancestral religious traditions, and because we were empowered and guided by our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors, as well as those divinities, who are connected to us by blood that we incarnated with. We wage war against the whites in our spring, forced the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere through taking up metal armaments as well as waging chemical and biological warfare against the whites and their offspring, who do root work, conjure, and so forth, juju, wanga, being the precedent that was established for chemical and biological warfare, the precedent that we established back then is a foundation we have to build upon today. So this is what we deal with on the Ojira broadcast. On Awukuda Akwada Wednesday nights, we have Egwa Marketplace Day. We showcase Akurakani Akurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions who are serving the Akurakani Akurakani community in a positive capacity, those who maintain their ancestral religious values in the context of their service to the community. So we've showcased a number of businesses, organizations, and institutions. We've also published our Okom Economic Development Model, which is an approach to economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values. Thus, it is a um, holistic approach to economic development for Afurakani and Afurakani people, and we deal with the philosophical foundation, a holistic approach to economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values on that broadcast. On our Yauda Yada Abada, Thursday broadcast, I'm in some affairs of the nation. We deal with specific issues that are confronting us as an Omain, as a nation, specifically Ojira Mai, the purified Ojira Omain nation, mine in the West, the land of the setting sun. 
O Jiramai means the purified nation of Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. Because we have migrated or were forced to migrate, but after that process, we were directed and guided by our ancestresses and ancestors to coalesce in a specific region of the Earth Mother's body in the West, interface with the Earth Mother divinities in this specific region of their body in the West, taking in plant life, animal life, mineral life for food as well as medicine from this specific region of the Western Hemisphere of the Earth Mother's body, dealing with the unique expression of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, the manifestation of the forces in nature from this region of the Earth Mother's body, and of course, blending ancestral blood circles and bringing ancestresses and ancestors back through these unions and so forth, this uh, confluence of events allows us to forge a locative identity, a unique expression of Afurakani, Afurakani culture, and people born of our interfacing with this region of the Western Hemisphere, this region of the Earth Mother's bodies and so forth. Therefore, we have a unique approach to ancestral religious practice, a unique approach to solving our problems rooted in our experience. This is what we deal with when we talk about Amaniye or nationism, the purification of nationalism. We approach our issues from a nationist perspective, and this is what we deal with on Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. So tonight, our broadcast, dealing with the Akradin Bosom, the Akan Abosom, the deities of the 11 body systems in the seven-day week. Now, one of the things that we have done, which we have pioneered, with regard to the nature of the abosom, the forces in nature that animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week, we have shown, number one, that the seven-day week was established by ancient Kanat people, people of ancient Kanat, so-called Nubian, so forth, ancient Akan people, this is why Akan people still have the seven-day week that was established thousands of years ago. We took that seven-day week up into the so-called Near East, into Kanana, which is later called Canaan, now it's Palestine, Israel, and so forth, prior to these fictional cartoon character uh, prophets and so forth who never existed from the Bible, no matter color, whether it's white, black, or otherwise, they did not exist. We took this seven-day week into Kangi, which is a title of ancient Sumer and so forth, the deities that animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which govern the seven-day week are the exact same deities that you find in ancient Sumer, are the same names and descriptive titles with the same functions that we have in the Akan tradition today. We've proven that, and we're the first to prove that in our book series, Akradim Boson, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And Volume 3 is coming out, and Volume 4 is com coming out very soon. Another thing that we have pioneered is to show exactly who these deities are, show them in ancient command with the exact same names, same titles, same ritual functions and creation, same ritual colors and so forth, proving the identity of these forces in nature. Also showing that there are 11 abosom that govern the seven-day week. We show that connection. Of course, we pioneered that when we first released a series of 11 articles on each one of these 11 divinities. And now we're talking about their regulatory functions within the 11 body systems. Of course, these are deities that regulate all natural cycles in creation. We've shown that their connection and identity in the various traditions. These exact same divinities exist in the Yoruba tradition, the Igbo tradition, um, Efe and Fon tradition, and so forth. Every Afurakani, Afurakani group of people deal with these forces in nature because these are major divinities that regulate all natural cycles in creation. And we want to focus today on their regulatory function with regard to the 11 body system, which, of course, this is also a work that we are the first to publish this information. This information is born out of our direct experience. Of course, it can be proven not only in the Akan language, also compared to the Igbo language and Yoruba language and Efe and Fon languages, also shown in ancient Kanid and Kemet, and we show them to do through the hieroglyphs and the articles and so forth to prove the names of these deities, their identity and so forth. But we're able to draw this information out because we still practice 
the culture. So when you have individuals on the continent of Afraikaid, a certain group of individuals have been corrupted by Christianity, Islam, white culture in general, inclusive of those who have been matriculating through university programs and so forth. They don't know who these, the first seven divinities are. In reality, they don't know that there are actually 11. They can't identify them. They don't work with them on a regular basis ritually, so they really don't know who they are. And therefore, they don't understand that they are central to all aspects of our kind ancestral culture. When the creator of the universe, Yonkumpon, has a kradin, which is Kwame, when the creator has a kradin, a soul name, which is taken from the names of the divinity, specifically governing Amiminida or Saturday and so forth, and the planet Amimini, and the various other Abosom deities have Akradin or soul names, and you understand that this notion of the Akradin Bosom is central to all aspects of existence. It is because when we left the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, when we were forced away through the Musuo Kessie, the great perversity, the enslavement era, over 300 years ago, our ancestors and ancestors who were snatched up and thrown on boats and so forth, the manner in which they were practicing Akan ancestral religion then was time-stamped into their bones and blood. It was fossilized in their bones and blood. So the manner in which we were practicing Akan ancestral religion over 300 years ago, that is the specific expression of the culture, the pristine, uncut, uncorrupted expression of the culture that we pass down intergenerationally here in the Western Hemisphere. What happened with Akan people since we left 300 years ago, with the introduction of Christianity and more incursions of Islam and white culture, and including white socioeconomic theories and so forth, those corruptions that took place since we left, we had nothing to do with that. How they changed the practice of ancestral religion and the perception of ancestral religion and the understanding of the cosmology and so forth, we had nothing to do with that because we were already gone. So we're still practicing and passing down the same pristine culture we were practicing when we left. We were possessing and communicating with the Akradin Bosom when we left. And this is why in the Hoodoo tradition, we still deal with the Akradin Bosom. In Jamaica, in the Obia tradition, they still deal with the Akradin Bosom. In Suriname, in South America, they still deal with the Akradin Bosom. You'll find many individuals on the continent. Some will believe that there are no deities who govern the seven days of the week. They think they're just named after the days. And you have some who acknowledge, well, there are tutelary spirits that govern the seven days, but they are not sure who they are. But we have proven irrefutably exactly who they are. You have some other individuals who have manufactured stories, which are contemporary stories, about the origin of the seven-day week because they don't know who these abosom are. And they've manufactured contemporary stories, for example, like the abosom, Tano having seven sons and their name after the seven days of the week, and this is where you get the seven days, that is totally inaccurate. So we've proven conclusively, irrefutably, who these deities actually are. And that comes from direct practice. It comes from direct communication with these divinities who govern Akra, Akrawa, our heads. So we're going to get, in, get to the Akra Dean Bosom page. We'll put the link in the chat room. You'll see the chart as well. This is a chart we just published. Go forward. So first we'll put the link to the Akra Dean Bosom page on our website. Then we're going to place the link. And if you go on our Facebook page, you'll see this, this uh, chart that we just published the other day, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And, of course, this information is in the book series. Volumes 1 and 2 are out. Volume 3 is coming up very soon, as well as Volume 4. So all of these, everything we talk about tonight will be included. It's either already included or the coming volumes, it will be included. So first we're going to go quickly about dealing with who the Akradin Bosom are, and then we're going to show their connections with regard to regulatory functions of the 11 body systems. We've talked about them with regard to their functions in nature, but we want to focus tonight specifically 
since we're talking about how ancestry religion impacts every aspect of our lives, how they specifically regulate the 11 major body systems of Akurakani, Akurakani people only, of course. All right, so on the Akra Dean Boson page, you'll see we show these solar, lunar, and planetary bodies. We state that the Akra Dean Boson in our Khan culture are the Abosom, the divinities, deities, spirit forces, and creation who govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven day Akan week or Nawotwe. It is from the Akradin Bosom or Akradin Abosom that Akan people derive our Akradin or souls names, which are also called Dadin or day names. And just to note, we did a twice when we were doing Ustream broadcasts, we did an 11 part series on the Akradin Bosom and dedicated one broadcast to each one of these 11 deities. And then a couple of years ago, when we started doing blog talk, we did an additional. 11-part series based on our articles of each one of these 11 deities, and we went into detail, in further detail, on each one of these divinities. But as we said tonight, the specific um, focus tonight is on the 11 body systems. So just so you know, if you want details about the articles that we wrote, you'll see we're going, we're going to go through some portions of these 11 articles that we've written on each one of the divinities, including the information in the books, but we also have those two sets of 11, two 11-part 11 series sets, one from the Ustream broadcast, one from the Blog Talk radio broadcast archives, and they're all on this page. You'll see all 24 on this page. You can access those whenever you like. So the Abosom, singular Abosom, are the deities, the goddesses and gods, the divine spirit forces in creation. They are referred to as Inyamewa, Inyame Ma. The children, Ma, of Nyamewa, and Nyame, the great mother and great father, the great goddess, the great god, Nyamewa, and Nyame are called Amen, Amenet, and Amen in ancient Kanin and Kemet. Of course, they are Mawu and Lisa and Vodun and Olokun and Olorun in the Yoruba tradition and so forth, Komosu and Chuku and Ibu, Ibo and so forth. And they are Katieleo and Kolotielo in the Senufo tradition. Everybody understands that there's a great mother and great father who function together as a divine unit, two halves of the divine whole, which we call the spring bed. And we show an image of Amenet and Amen sitting together from the temple of Apet, Brasit, and ancient Kemet. Amenet and Amen have always been two halves of a whole. There was never a time when there was just Amenet without Amen. There was never a time when there was just Amen without Amenet. So the Abosom, the deities, are the Asumsum, the spirits operating through the many suns, moons, stars, planetary bodies, oceans, rivers, mountains, wind, fire, and the black substance of space comprising Abadie or creation. They are the divine, quote unquote, organs regulating order within the great divine body of Nyamewa, Nyame, the great mother and great father, just as your organs, smaller bodies, regulate order within the greater body, you. The Akradin Bosom are a particular grouping of Abosom. This group of 11 deities, Abosom, is a particular grouping of Abosom identified by their unique functions within the greater company of Abosom. Then we talk about the 11 articles on the page, dealing with each one of these divinities and so forth. We talk about Nanasom, ancestral religion. We talk about the names of these divinities. We have a chart. We link to our book, the Okra Okra Complex, these deities. Uh, if we go up to that section, we talk about the nature and function of ancestry religion, which we just talked about earlier. For our Khan people, the Yakradin or soul names, Kwesi, Akosui, also Esi, Kwajo, Ajua, Kwabena, Abena, Kweku, Akua, Yao, Ya, Aba, Kofi, Afua, Kwame, Ama, and their many variations are directly related to our nkra, nkra be our divine function in creation, for they are given to our soul, our akra, by the akradin bosom. Our names, akradin, are derived directly from the akradin bosom, the divinity that governs our kra. 
the okra or okra, the male or female divinity, is a divine soul, divine consciousness, the soul. It is a drop from the ocean of divine consciousness, which is the okra, okra, the ka, the kayet, the soul, the divine consciousness or intelligence of nyamewa, nyame. The okra, or the okra, female, okra, male, is an obosom, a deity, which is assigned to the apurakani, apurakani, individual by nyamewa, nyame, and dwells within the head region. The ability of our Khan people to embrace and execute our nkra, nkrabia, our divine function in the world, is rooted in each individual aligning his his or her sum sum is spirit with his or her okra or okra soul and invoking and harmonizing with his or her kradin bosom. The okra, okra as our own personal bosom operates under the energy of the kradin bosom. Our okra, okra therefore guides our thoughts, intentions, and actions towards harmony with inyamewa inyame based on our unique function in creation. So just like you have a physical body and your brain is a smaller body regulating order within your physical body, it's in the head region, you have a spirit body, which in Akan is called Sum Sum, the spirit body. In the head region of the spirit body is an entity, a deity, that the supreme being directs to go dwell in your head region to guide you throughout the course of your life. This male deity, if you're a male, is seated in your head region in the form of a spirit's brain, a force in the head region. The female deity, if you're a female, is seated in your head region in your spirit body. It is that force that pulls you in your head region towards thoughts, intentions, and actions that are in harmony with divine order and pushes you away from thoughts, intentions, and actions that are disharmonious. Because written into that divine force, that female divinity or male divinity, is the specific function you are to execute in creation. Just like every cell in the body has a specific function to execute in the body, we are cells within the great divine body of the supreme being. We are children of organs, and those organs are children of the great body. The organs are the deities. The cells are us, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and afurakani, afurakani, human life only. We have a specific function as a certain kind of cell, as a child of a certain kind of organ or deity that regulates order within the body. When we execute our divine function in creation, we're serving the whole body at the same time. We're a cell serving the whole body at the same time. The deity that governs your head is seated in the head region. The divine function is wired into or written into that force. That's why it can pull you in certain directions and when you're engaged in in activity that is out of harmony with your function that's written into your kra, your krawa, then your krawa will, or kra will direct you away from those kinds of behaviors, thoughts, intentions, and so forth. That's a divinity, a force of nature. It's called Ori, you know, in the Yoruba tradition, say Lido and Vodun, it's called Ka, male, Kaet, female, in ancient command. It's called Chi and Ibo. Our kra is governed by the kra being both song one of the 11 divinities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that regulate all um, at natural cycles in creation. So when we're born on a specific day, we are sent into the womb by our ancestresses and ancestors, and it is um, guaranteed that we will emerge on a specific day as an indication to the community that we were assigned to the abosom that governs that day pre-incarnation. So when we come out on Ben Nada or Abin Nada, which is Tuesday, that means that we were assigned to the deity Benna, the male deity Benna for males with the female divinity Abinna for females pre-incarnation. And because we were assigned to them pre-incarnation and our heads are governed by them, then we are sent into the womb and eventually born into the world. The deity Benna or Abinna will make sure that we will, are born on Ben Nadal, Ben Nadal Tuesday as an indication to the community that we were assigned to them pre-incarnation. That's the key. That's why it says, quote, unquote, Dadin or day name, but it's really a Kradin or soul name. So we show who the 
divinities are Awusi, Ajwa, Abena, Bena, Akua, Awuku, Yao, Ya, Aba, Afi, and Ameme. They are the primary male and female Abosom operating through the Oriya, which is the sun, the Osorane, the moon, and the Ochin, Nsoroma, the planets, planetary bodies which govern the seven day week. And we talk about Nsoroma in the tree language means sky, children, that's the term for stars. The Ochin means wanderers, so the Ochin, Nsoroma, the wandering stars, that's just a title of planets because they're in different positions when you see them at night and so forth. So, we have a chart. We have a couple of charts here. We talk about the days of the week and the names of the divinities and the planets. We have a chart, day of the week, the name of the divinity, the female, Akradim, the female soul names, um, their praise names, female praise names, then the male, Akradim, the male soul names, and then the praise names. So, for example, Akwesida or Awusida, Esida, Sunday. The male divinity is Awusi. Female divinity is Esi. Um, the Akra name for females is Akosuya or Akosua, Akwesiba, Esi, Kisi, and so forth. Different titles, variations of the Akra name, soul name for a female. The male is Kwesi, Kwasi, Akwesi, C or CC. Different titles for the male. Um, they have praise names like Vodria or Obwe Quine, and so forth, different titles having different um, characteristics. And the same for all the different divinities. We have a chart for all of the days of the week and the days. We also have a chart after that showing the day of the week, the name of the deity of the day of the week, male and female. And we also show their equivalents in the Orisha tradition, the Yoruba tradition, the Vodou tradition, Ebe and Fon, and the, the culture of ancient Kemet. So Awusi, for example, on Sunday, the male divinity of Sunday Awusi is Awusi or Alsar in ancient Kemet. He's Obatala in the Yoruba tradition. He's Dangbe in Vodun. Ajua is also called Esi. She's called Odua in Yoruba. She's Minona in Vodun. She's Aset in ancient Kemet. She's also called Essie in Coptic, and this is why she's also called Essie in Akan. She's Ajua when operating through the moon, and Essie when she's in connection with Riot, operating through the sun. Benna and Abena in Akan is Ogun and Iyamiya Benni, male and female divinities in Orisha. They're Ogu and Ananu in Vodun. They're Heru Bedeti and Sekhmet in ancient Kemet. Of course, Sekhmet or Sechimet becomes Sechimet or Sechima in Akan. It's another a title of Abena and Akan, they have the same titles in ancient Kemet as well, as well as they do in the Akan tradition. Awuku and Akua, the male and female divinities governing so-called Mercury. Eshu and the wife of Eshu is Agberu, so it's Eshu and Agberu in Yoruba. Legba and Koni Koni in Vodun. Set and Nebet Het in ancient Kemet. On Yauda or Yada is Yao, Ya, and Abba. That's Shango. Oya and Oba in Yoruba, Hebioso, Avejida and Ayaba in Vodun, Heru, the son of Alsar and Aset, Wachet and Nekabet in ancient Kemet. Afi or Afia, Afua, also called Mimminit. She's called, also called Cheche in Akan. She's called Oshun in the Yoruba tradition. She's Azili or Ezuli in Vodun. She's Het Heru in ancient Kemet, which is Cheche in Akan. And you have Amin Min, the deity of Mimenida, Saturday, Amin Men in Akan, he's Orisha Oko in, in the Yoruba tradition, he's Azaka in Vodun, he's Amin Men in ancient Kemet. So the articles go into detail showing the connections between these different divinities and so forth. And now we're going to get into what we're the key for tonight. The next part of the page says the Akradi and Bosom also have Abosom Komre. Abosom shrines within Asase Afua, the Earth Mother, including Earth's core, black earth, rivers, ionosphere, rainwaters, red earth, wind, thunder and lightning, magnetosphere and the sky and the polar regions axis. So these different aspects of creation. You have the Earth Mother divinities, Asase Afua and Asase Ya, which are the twin Earth Mother divinities, but within the planet. Of course, you have, so they govern the planet, but of course, within the planet, 
itself, you have the atmosphere, you have the wind, you have mountains, you have, um, you know, uh, river waters, you have black earth, you have red earth, the magnetosphere, the polar axis, and so forth, these different aspects of creation. Spirits animate these different aspects of creation. These are the Akradin Boson. In addition, we say the Akradin Boson are associated with certain organs and organ systems within the Afurakani, Afurakani African black body, as well as the spiritual organs and spiritual organ systems within the spiritual anatomy body of Afurakanu, Afurakainu Africans, black people. And here we have the chart that we released yesterday. And just to give a further context, as a grouping of Abosom du Biako, or 11 deities, that's a sacred number grouping found in ancient Akan culture, ancient Kanid and Kemet, as well as contemporary Akan culture. The Mer texts or pyramid texts address the Postjet At and the Postjet Inchaset, the so-called Great Ennead or grouping of deities, and the smaller or lesser Ennead, or grouping of deities. The small Ennead, or the Postjet and Chaset, is comprised of 11 Ntoru, Ntoru Tu, 11 divinities, 11 Aboso. In the Mera text, the pyramid text of Unas, utterance 219, lines 178, as well as lines 181 through 192, you'll see an address to these 11 Abosom, this grouping of 11 Abosom in the pyramid texts. The pyramid texts are the oldest religious compositions yet unearthed in the world. So you have a grouping of 11 Abosom. Then in the contemporary Akan culture, there's a story about how the Abosom came into the world. We have a link to that story. It's a narrative rooted in ancient Canadian command referencing 11 children who became Abosom, how the Abosom came into the world. So we go into detail about that. And we also say this Postjet Ntoru, Ntoru Tu, the so-called Paut Ntoru, is absolutely unrelated to the pseudoscience, pseudo-spiritualism of Kabbalism and its quote-unquote tree of life, which is a recently manufactured white, pseudo-cosmogramic cosmogramic perversion with no authentic foundation in ancient Kemet or any Afurakani, Afurakani ancestral religion or culture. Of course, they looked at the Paul Ntoru Ntortu and tried to manufacture a version of the grouping of divinities, which their version is off, misinformed. They put archangels and separatists and all of this other nonsense together, we're dealing with actual deities which they don't really have a concept of that we communicate directly with. Even their associations are misguided and so forth. Moreover, there are more than just one grouping of divinities. There are numerous sacred groupings, number groupings of Abosom, including the nine Abosom of the Postjet, Ah, or the so-called Great Ennead, the eight Abosom of Kemenu, which is misnomer to Agduad, the seven Heru Abosom, the four Abosom who are the sons of Heru, the 42 Abosom who are the assessors of Ma'a and Ma'at, and more. Each grouping of Abosom has its own significance and function, just as each organ system in the body has its own significance and function. And we talk about the endocrine system, digestive system, respiratory system, and so forth, which we're about to get into. The different abosome groupings function harmoniously in the divine body just as the organ systems function harmoniously in the afurakani, afurakani body. So it's not just, you know, like Kabbalism will say, talk about these sephiroth and so forth, or the archangels, which they misclassify, misname, don't understand the attributes of the original divinity, so what they are putting forward is misinformation. It's not ancient. It's not arcane wisdom. It's misinformation. We're going to get into that in other broadcasts. And, of course, as with all our bosom, Marisha, Vodou, Ntoru, Ntoru, Misnomer, Netaru, Netaru, the forces in nature, they have never and will never work with 
the whites and their offspring. They only work with Afurakani, Afurakani people. We are the only created human beings on earth. The whites and their offspring are cancerous cells within the great divine body. They are isolated and slated for eradication. They are not possessed by nor communicated with by the forces in nature. Your body isolates cancerous cells to destroy them. Your body does not embrace cancerous cells in a harmonious fashion. They isolate them to destroy them. That means white Europeans, white Americans, white Asians, white Hispanics, white pseudo-Native Americans who are just invading Asians, white Arabs, white Hindus, white Latinos, and so forth. None of the whites in their offspring have ever communicated with the Aboso, Marisha, Vodou, Ntoru, Ntorutu, and never will. That is an irrefutable reality. That is true of the tradition on the continent as well as Hudu, Juju, Vodun, Wanga, and so forth in the Western Hemisphere. Anyone who claims otherwise is a fraud. Now, let's get into this chart. And we put the link to the chart in the chat room. So what we did with the chart is we showed the 11 Akradin Bosom, their manifestations, their, some of their popular manifestations in ancient Kemet and Kanat. Then we show the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that they animate. We show their names in the Akan tradition. We show their names in ancient Kemet. And when you look at the descriptive titles of their name in the Medusa, the Hieroglyphs of ancient Kemet, they are the exact same names in the Akan tradition. Then we show the names of the 11 major body systems and images from those different systems in association with these divinities. So we just want to go through them and we're talking about regulatory function. So, for example, and we're going to pull this up right quick. So, when you look on the Akradian Boson page, um, if you click, you'll see volume one of the book Akradian Boson that's dealing with trustery and the nature of the Akradian Boson and some trustery and so forth. Then, when you get to volume two, and it says Ajua, Awusi, and Ajua is talking about Asar and Aset. Volume 3 will be dealing with Benna and Abena. Volume 4 will be dealing with Awuku and Akua. Volume 5 will be dealing with Yao, Yao and Aba. Volume 6 will be dealing with Afi and Ami and Men, and you'll have the whole system set up. So this is Volume 2, Awusi and Ajua. When you look in the Awusi section, if you click on, click on the ebook version, you can download the entire book for free, as all of our 29 books are free downloads, the ebook versions. You look on page 11, we start talking about the nature of the divinity, Awusi. And we say in our Khan culture, a major Abosom operating through the Oriya, the sun is called Awusi. The Abosom Awusi is called Awisi, Ayisi, Asi, Sisi, and Akwesi. Awusi is the male Okradin Bosom of Akwesi Da or Awusi Da, so called Sunday. Awusi, who in H. Kemet is called Awusi or Asar, it's called Obatala in the Yoruba tradition, Dangbe and Vodun. Agu, Isi, and Ibo is where we get Aku, Isi, or Akwesi. And Akan is the same as Agu, Isi, and Ibo. Awusi establishes regulatory order in creation. He is the Obosom who operates as the divine endocrine system, the regulatory structure within Obadie or creation within the divine body of Nyamewa, Nyame. He thus operates as the endocrine system within the Afurakani, Afurakani, black body. So that's the key. We're talking about regulatory functioning. If you look at the 11 major systems, the endocrine system, of course, is a major system. So if you look up some information on the endocrine system, the, the master gland of the endocrine system is the pituitary gland. If you look at some basic information, which, of course, you can get from any um, published information on human anatomy and so forth, the endocrine system is the collection of glands of an organism that secrete hormones directly into the circulatory system and be carried towards distant target organs. In humans, the major endocrine glands include the pineal gland, pituitary gland, pancreas, ovaries, testes, thyroid gland, parathyroid gland, and adrenal glands. Now, 
The special features of endocrine glands are, in general, their ductless nature. So that diffuse neural endocrine system, the, that the system of ductless glands, whereas the exocrine system that we're going to get into, um, the glands have ducts. But the endocrine glands, they secrete hormones directly into the circulatory system. So they have a ductless nature. Their vascularity is, is key and commonly the presence of intracellular vacuoles or granules that store their hormones. In contrast, as we said, the exocrine glands, such as salivary glands, sweat glands, and glands within the gastrointestinal tract tend to be much less, much less vascular and have ducts or hollow lumen. Now, if you look in the section where we're talking about Awusi, we talk about his, the root of his name, C. When we talk about the endocrine system on page 12, in our book, endocrine system helps control growth and development, homeostasis, internal balance of body systems, metabolism, reproduction, and response to stimuli, stress and or injury. The pituitary gland is the master gland of the endocrine system and thus regulates its functioning in the same fashion. Asi or Awusi establishes regulatory order in creation. Among the planets, stars, suns, moons, oceans, winds, plant life, animal life, mineral life, Afrakani, Afrakani, human life, your organs and systems, spiritual potencies, forces, and so on. When that regulatory order is established within the Afrakani, Afrakani population, the communal quote unquote body, it manifests as the establishment of civilization. Those Afrakanu, Afrakainu who are born of and guided by the energy and consciousness of Awusi or Asi are therefore those who manifest the capacity to establish civilization, a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. Of course, when you look at the function of Osar establishing civilization and so forth, he's placed at the head of the divinities, him as well as Osset, the male and female head of the divinities, not because they're the oldest divinities, but because of their regulatory function. The pituitary gland is a, is a master gland within the body. It has two lobes, the posterior lobe and the anterior lobe, governed by Osar and Osset. But the overall functioning is the Alsarian gland, and then we'll show the reproductive system connected to all set and so forth. But that, but they have um, exchanges between the two systems. Alsar and Alset operate through the endocrine system and the master gland, the two lobes of the pituitary. But then you also have Alsar and Alset both operating within the reproductive system of the males and females as well. But predominantly. Osar is governing the endocrine system. Predominantly, Osset is governing the reproductive system, which we're going to get to next. So you have the pituitary gland unceasing and it's in executing its regulatory functions, its overseeing functions. Of course, when you look at the uh, Adinkra symbol of the Abodie, Santen, all of creation, you see the Guan, you see the, the eye, the all-seeing eye, and so forth. When you look at, look at the name of Osar is spelled with the throne and also the eye and so forth. So we go into detail about that as far as the symbolism goes. But Osar Asi leads the way, instituting processes that support Nyame Wa Nyame and Sheshe divine order. He is the one to whom is given the Bojuya, the animal's tail or whisk, the protective symbol, the symbol of the leader. Those who are born under his influence and are directed by him, therefore, have the capacity to order, institute, the term is C or NCC, the root of Asi or Asir, civilization, lead, and give proper guidance. They are protectors for the institutionalization of civilization by such individuals as for the perpetuation of Inyamewa, Inyame, and Sheshi, or divine order amongst the people. Said perpetuation is the foundational protection against very potential manifestations of disorder. Civilization being institutionalized is the foundational protection against potential manifestations of disorder. So when the, a leader, I see, I will see, and the root of the name is see, which is the throne, I see the throne, which is called I see in Akan, it's also called I see in ancient Kemet, that throne which makes up the hieroglyph of his name and then the I after that. The root C meaning the throne and so forth, that is the foundation upon which the civilization is established, the queen's throne and the king's throne and so forth. And of course, CC in Akan, the lower part of the back, dealing with the lower part of the back, 
where the ilium is joined to the lumbar vertebrae, you know, the pelvis region, which is the seat, and you see the, the uh, sacrum fused in the pelvis region, and that's the same symbol for all star and ancient commence. So we go into detail about that. That's the foundation that's thrown, the establishment, the institutionalization of regulatory order and so forth, the seat of government and all of that. We go into detail about that. But the endocrine system, headed up by the pituitary gland with, with its dual lobes, secretes hormones into the bloodstream, and they give directives that regulate the functions of other glands. Those hormones go all throughout, and sometimes they trigger other glands to release hormones that go all throughout the system and touch almost every um, gland and organ and tissue and so forth, regulating order within the body. Osar is a divinity that um, instigates regulatory order within creation. So that endocrine system is governed by Osar or Awusi. So when you read the information dealing with Awusi, you'll see, in the book, you'll see all of the various details, the symbolism. We show his different titles, Awusi, Awisi, Asi, Aisi, all these different titles and what they mean in the Akan tradition. And then we show their correlations in the language of ancient command, what they've been due to and so forth and symbolism. So that's that regulatory order that you find in the endocrine system. Now next, you'll see we get to Ajua, which is our set. When our star and our set operate through the moon, they're called Ajo and Ajua in Akan. They're called Ucho and Uchua in ancient Kemet, which is dealing with the moon. In the Coptic dialect, the late Kemet dialect, the term yahu, meaning moon, becomes yo, I-O-H, yo, meaning moon. And this is why in our Khan culture, the term for moon day or Monday is jo, da, or jo, day, the day of jo, the cool one talking about the moon. That comes from yo in the Coptic dialect talking about the moon. And there's also the moon is seen as the left eye of Ra and the left eye of Peru and so forth, so it's called Ucho and Uchua, and this is where you get Ajo and Ajua in Akan dealing with the moon. So when Osar and Aset operate through the moon, they're operating through the Ajo and Achua, their left eye, and they're called Ajo and Ajua. But when they are operating in harmony with Ra and Ra'et, they operate through the sun, and they're called Asi and Esi, or Awusi and Esi, Osar and Aset. I saw an Essie. Essie is the title of our set in Coptic in the late Kemet dialect as well, just as it is in Akan. So that's the connection. So we can call her Ajua when she's operating through the moon, but she's also Essie when she's operating in harmony with Riot, animating the sun. So here we're talking about, and we talk about both. We talk about Ajua, we talk about our different titles Ajua, Awo, um, <clears throat> Adai are different titles, but then we also get into her function as she's called Asi, Riot, Set in ancient Kemet. She's called Esi in ancient Kemet, and she's also called Esi in Akan, which is all set. But we first start talking about her role as operating through Jodah, Monday, the moon, and this is what we say about her. In Akan culture, a major female abosom operating through the Osorane, the moon is called Ajua. Ajua is also called Awo. Ajua is the female Okradin Bosom of Joda Monday. Ajua maintains reg regulatory order in creation. She is the Obosom who operates with the divine reproductive system, the executive structure within Abadie or creation, within the divine body of Nyamewa, Nyame, the Supreme Being. She thus operates as the reproductive system within the Afurakani, Afurakani black body. And we go into detail about the root name Jo, Ajo, Ajua, and so forth, as well as her titles Awo, meaning mother, and Awo, meaning childbirth, labor, nativity, Wo, meaning to gender, engender, beget, generate, procreate. It also means cool, and so forth. It also means um, Ajua, means throne, and so forth. So we go into a great deal of detail with that. The Abosom Ajua is a spirit force who has a regulatory function in creation. 
She regulates the functions and operations of other abosons. The Oriya sun sends its energy to Asase Earth, heating the planet while activating its atmosphere. The Osrane, the moon, which is also called the Bosom, um, receives and retains the energy of the Oriya, the sun. The resultant energy of this process, including moonlight, in concert with the gravitational force, of the Osorani, the moon, affects the increase in water levels, tides, and cools earth, Asase. Joda, the day of Ajua, is the day of the Osorani, the moon, moon day or Monday. The cooling effect, Jo, cooling effect of this celestial body on the atmosphere of Asase, regulating the temperature and its cooling effect upon the sur- surface of Asase earth, increasing water levels, is what gives the major abosom operating through the Osorane, the moon, the title Ajua or Ajo, the root of which is Jo, meaning to cool. We show not think or symbol, which is called Ajo. The Ebe or proverb says, when the king has good counselors, the rain will be peaceful or cool, Ajo. And of course, the queen mother is the highest level counsel of the king. So we, we show that, but then we get into awo, meaning a title of ajwa, which means mother, as in one's own mother. It also means childbirth and labor. We also show that awo not only means childbirth and labor and mother to engender, appropriate, and so forth. In Akan, the term awo in ancient Kemet shows the pregnant mother on her knees and so forth. It's the exact same term with the exact same meaning and actually showing in the medu- in the hieroglyph the pregnant woman with the full belly and so forth. So we go into some detail talking about our woke with childbirth or labor, dealing with delivery and so forth. Ajawa as Awo is the great mother of conception, labor and childbirth. It is the coolness, Joe, of the womb that allows the baby to develop properly. It is also the coolness Ojo within the male reproductive organs, which facilitates the readiness of the sperm cells to fertilize the ovum. Without the requisite coolness, Jo, there is no fertilization and no embryogenesis. Excessive heat in the womb area disrupts the development of the fetus. Excessive heat kills mature sperm cells. Ajwa as awo governs the uterus and vagina structure of the Afrikan female and the complementary prostate and penis structure of the Afurakani male in order for conception to take place. We're talking about the uterus and vagina structure in the female, the swelling of the male member and so forth, the pregnant male member and so forth in that context, but then you also have the masculine side of the male energy with Ajo, Osar as well. So we show the male and female reproductive organs, the uterus and the vagina structure, the prostate and the phallus, which is connected, of course, the ovaries and the testes are connected, the fallopian tubes and the epididymis of the male are, are reflective of one another. The uterus and vagina structure have reflexive areas which are connected to the various major organs and glands of the body. These reflexive areas of these structures, when stimulated through the process of procreativity, regulate the functions and operations of the various organs and glands of the body. This is similar to the reflexology points on the foot or hand. Just as the uterus, vagina, as well as the prostate, phallus complexes are connected to and regulate the various organs and structures in your body through reflection, so is awo, which is adua, as a divine organ structure, connected to and regulates the functions and operations of the various divine organs, abosom, which exist in as the divine body of Nyame wa Nyame, supreme being. Ajwa as Awo, the great mother, functions as the divine birth house, birth canal in creation. The divine womb and birth canal within the divine body of Nyame wa, the great mother. Just like you have a uterus and vagina structure, birth house, birth canal, the great birth house and great birth canal is Ajua, who is called Odua in Yoruba. She's called Aset, of course, in ancient Kemet. She's called Minona in Vodun. She is the great 
birth house and birth canal within the great divine body of Inyamewa or Amenet, the great mother. Just like the womb structure has reflexive points connected to all of the organs and glands in the body, in the great divine body, it's the same as true within the Afraikaini female body. So she regulates the different functions of the organs and glands. She has a regulatory function in creation. Now, so we say just like she has that in, you know, in creation, same thing with regard to the physical body. When she regulates order and creation amongst the planets, stars, suns, moons, oceans, winds, plant life, animal life, mineral life, she's giving birth to these things, the great womb. When that regulatory order is maintained within the Afurakani, Afurakani civilization population, the communal body, it manifests as the maintenance of civilization. Those Afurakanu, Afurakainu Africans who are born of and guided by the energy and consciousness of Ajua are therefore those who manifest the capacity to maintain civilization or social order rooted in the divine order of creation. Then we talk about the connection between the pituitary gland through hormonal, hormonal secretion stimulating the reproductive organs of the female and male. Ovulation, spermatogenesis takes place as a result of that. The interworkings of the pituitary and the uterus, as in uterine contractions, facilitate the release of oxytocin during labor. The pituitary also releases oxytocin for lactation. Awusi governs the pituitary, while Ajwa governs the uterus vagina structure. They're functioning together. The pituitary gland, of course, has the follicle stimulating hormone, and the other hormones that deal with um, labor and so forth. The uterine contractions facilitate the release of oxytocin during labor. So there's a feedback mechanism between pituitary and the uterus structure. All SAR and all set operating within the body with regard to bringing forth a child. And, of course, when they're operating within the organs themselves, the prostate and the phallus of the male and the uterus and the vagina of the female, that birthing structure, all SAR and all set as Ajo and Ajua working together there as well. So they, they work together in the reproductive system. They work together in the two lobes, the pituitary gland, anterior and posterior. But Alsar primarily dealing with the pituitary and the endocrine system, offset dealing with the reproductive system. We're talking about the birthing system, birthing and gestation and so forth. We're going to get to Het Heru, who's connected to the fallopian tubes and the house of Heteru, which is the fallopian tubes and so forth. We're talking about the overall uterus structure, birth, birthing house, birth canal, and so forth, that structure that is connected to all of the organs and glands and therefore regulates the functions of the various organs and glands from the base of the person. Then you go to the head of the person with the pituitary gland, and you have the base and the head working together, all sarin all set in the head region, all sarin all set in the reproductive region. Okay, so next, look at the chart. You see that we're going to get into Benna and Abena. We go to the Akradin Boson page. We have articles on each one of them. And we're going to click real quick. You can click on the Benna article. We're not going to go through the whole piece. We just want to show. Actually, first, we'll click on the Abena article. Just going to look at the first portion of it. Abena is the abosom of the Ochin, the planet Abena, so-called Mars. Her day is Abena da Tuesday. She is the abosom of war, epidemic, healing, and menstruation. She spills blood through warfare. She spills blood through menstruation. Abena is in force arrest of divine order. Nyamewa, Nyame, and Sheshe, divine order. She is the principal agent test of the divine hate of Nyamewa, Nyame. Divine law or love is the expansive pole of divine order. Divine hate is the contracted pole of divine order. Ma'an, Ma'ada, the male and female forces of divine law. Terubadeti and Sekhmet are the male and female forces of divine hate, the contracted pole of divine order, where law or quote unquote love, because law and love is the same word as the 
expansive pole of divine order. We incorporate things through law or love, and we reject disorder or eliminate um, disorder through rejection or hate or contraction. So she's the principal agentess of the divine hate of the supreme being. Abena operates through the divine lymphatic system, the law enforcement structure within Abagye, the divine body of Inyamewa Inyame, and thus the lymphatic system within the Afurakani Afurakaitni, the black body. Now we go into some detail about this notion of menstruation and so forth, and we also talk about um, her connection to Pata. We show that Asechima, the menstrual cycle is the, in Akan, is Sechima, um, which is Sechima, or Sechimen, or Sekhmet, and Ancient Kemet, the same title of her. Then we get into some information here. Let's scroll down real quick. If you scroll down to page, okay, if you scroll down to page 10, in the article on Abedna, We show the inner core of Asase, the inner core of earth. We say that Abedna rejects that which is disordered perpetually without fail, compromise or profanation. The divine hate of Inyamewa Inyame encompasses all of the whites in their offspring, all non afrakanum all non afrakanu who exist, who have ever existed, and who ever will exist without exception until they become extinct. We're talking about when we show the image of the inner core of earth, and we also show, let me scroll down real quick. Okay, we show the Akan, I think we're supposed to Anibere, because we show lymphocytes, which are natural killer, some of them are natural killer cells, lymphocytes generated in the bone marrow and operant within the lymphatic fluid. We show a close-up of segment garment that's akin to the form of the Anibere, the Adinkra symbol, and the lymphocytes and so forth. We show the inner bone, the red and yellow bone marrow and so forth. That's the blood, the bojas, it's called an akan. Sekhmet operating through the inner core of the planet and on the planet Earth. In the inner core, you'll find her along with Pata and so forth. In the inner bone, which is a, the bone marrow, which is a major lymphoid, lymphoid organ and so forth. Lymphocytes being generated and so forth from that bone marrow, that red and yellow bone marrow and so forth. She's found within, inside the bone, just like she's inside the inner core of her. The fire that she generates, the fire that's generated in the marrow of the bones and so forth, generating that lymphatic response, isolating and destroying cancer cells and viral agents and so forth to eradicate them for the preservation of the integrity of the body. You have Apena on the female side and Benna, which is Heru Behudet or Heru Bedat, Heru Bendat. In Asia Kemet, he's called Benna and Akan on the male side. So she's waging war as the lymphatic system in the great divine body of the supreme being. She's waging war as the lymphatic system within your body, regulating as a regulatory function. It's one thing to have a number of different systems working harmoniously in the body, but if you didn't have an immune or lymphatic system, it doesn't ha- matter how wonderfully all of the other systems are structured, everything will fall apart as soon as some bacterial agents or viral agents enter into the system because you would have no protection. So the stability of creation is dependent upon the divinities of divine hate, the contractive forces of order that shut down and stamp out viral agents that would otherwise destroy creation or destroy or disrupt the natural order in your body that would destroy or disrupt your natural function. So when we show the lymphatic system, you see that's Abena. Then you flip to the other side. On the male side, you have Benna. We're going to pull that information up real quick. Go right back to the Akradin Boson on page. And you can click on the article for Benna. 
Hold on one second. Let me make sure we got that. And it's pulling up. So if you look at the – hold on a second. Let me get this. It didn't pull up correctly. Hold on one second. So Benna, if you have both some of the planet Benna, the male title of the planet. So Benna and Abena, Herubedeti and Sekhmet operate through the same planet, which we call Benna or Abena, the white scenario spring called Mars the red planet and so forth. You have the abosome of hot metal and war. Benna is the enforcer of divine order. He is the principal agent of the divine hate. Just like Sekhmet, Abena is the principal agentess of divine hate. He operates as the divine immune system, the military structure within Abadiye, the divine body of Nyamewa Nyame, and thus the immune system in the, within the Afurakani, Afurakani, the African black body. We talk about the difference between Heru Bedeti and Heru, son of Alsar and Alset. We show some of his titles in ancient Kemet. The term Ket, or Ket, is a title, part of his title. Heru, Heri Ket, or Heru, the chief of Ket, which is destruction, meaning hate, just like Sekhmet has Ket. In one of her titles as well, they literally have, when we show the etymology of the term hate in our book, um, in Mare um, Nechi, Divine Law and Divine Hate, that term ket comes from ancient Kemet. It's not a Proto-Indo-European root for the term hate. The term hate that becomes ket in the Proto-Indo-European language following meaning to break or destroy, comes directly from ancient Kemet, or ket, which means to break or destroy, and it shows the hieroglyph of the Medu of a man with a stick breaking or destroying and so forth, Heti, which becomes Het, also is a title of the flying wing, Sundis, the form that Heru Bedeti takes. So we show all of that information. We show images of a T cell killing a cancer cell, um, blood cells containing iron and so forth. His sacred color is red, um, also red and white. You see that the red and white cells, the operating through the immune system and so forth, all these different um, things. The iron is key with regard to immunity as well. So we show these connections to the immune system, Heru Bedeti, his symbolism in ancient Kemet. So you have the immune system on the masculine side. You have the lymphatic system on the feminine side. When they talk about Sekhmet, wading through the blood of the enemy when she slaughtered the disordered individuals in ancient Kemet. Ra sent her to go to slaughter the disordered men and women, and she create, you know, manifested a great slaughter, and then she started wading through the blood of the slaughtered and so forth. That is the lymphatic cells that are wading through the blood and so forth, attacking you know, the disordered cells and so forth that's uh, segment operating within the body in the physical body of the Afrakani, Afrakani person. So you have the immune system, and then you have the lymphatic system. You have Benna and Abana regulating immunity, regulating the stability of the body. Without the immune system, there is no stability. Okay. And, of course, if you have any questions or comments in the chat room, Log in as a user. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, hit the number one. All right, and we're going to go through the next piece. You can get to the article on Awuku. And our focus again here is specifically dealing with the systems that they regulate in the body. We also, in the articles, talk about how they regulate different aspects of creation and their symbolism in ancient Kemet and their titles in Yakan yeah, language and so forth. But tonight we just want to focus on the system. So Awuku or Aku, also called Kwekwe Nansi in the Akan tradition, also called Awuraku in Akan. He's also called Awur Hekau, the great one of divine words in ancient Kemet. That's the title of Set in ancient Kemet. He's called Awuraku as the title in Akan. 
He's also called Awuku or Aku. He's the Abosom of the planet Aku, so-called Mercury. Awuku Da is Wednesday, the day of Awuku. He is the divine messenger or communicator. He is also known as Anansi, the great spider, owner of all the stories of the supreme being. He governs the divine nervous system, dealing with the peripheral nervous system, the communicative structure of Abadie creation, the divine body of Nyamewa Nyame, and thus the nervous system peripheral within the Afurakani Afurakani black body. And he's also, of course, the owner of the death. We showed the term Uwuraku is the title of Awuku and Akan. Uwura means great one, master, and so forth. Uwura in ancient Kemet means great one, master, and so forth. Uwura Aku or Awuraku in Akan is the title of Aku in Akan. We show in the Medutsu, Uwura Hekau, the great one of divine words, is the title of a set in ancient Kemet. Same divinity, the trickster, the messenger. So you have a certain quality. Number one, he is the messenger of the supreme being. Number two, he's considered the trickster. Number three, he operates through the planet Mercury. Number four, he operates through the desert. That's in the Akan tradition. If you look at Set and ancient Kemet, he's the communicator after the contendings of Heru and Set. And Heru is judged to be the rightful heir of Osar and of the empire of, of the nation and so forth. Ra says that Set will come and dwell with him in the prow of the boat of Ra, and he will thunder for Ra. That means the planet Mercury, Awuku, will be sitting right next to the sun. It's the closest planet to the sun. It moves around the sun and orbits the sun faster, and therefore it can collect the energy of the sun and wield it throughout the solar system. It's the messenger planet, and he's at the front of the boat of Ra, and he's thundering or speaking for Ra. He becomes the messenger. So Set is the messenger. Set is the trickster. He attempts to trick Heru out of his inheritance. Set operates through the planet Set or Mercury or Sobek. Set governs the desert. Just as we said in Akan, Awuku or Awuraku is the messenger. He's also the trickster, Anansi the trickster. He's also operating through the planet Mercury. That's why he's Kweku, a Nazi one who was born on Wednesday is Kweku. He also there's a story about how Akwesi Awusu and Anansi, Aku Anansi, were in a struggle and so forth. And in Yonkompon, the creator, a judge that Akwesi Awusu would get the fertile land and Set's farm or Anansi's farm would become the desert. This is why Anansi, it's the same story about Sar and our Set. For Osar and Set, Osar, the black land, Kam Ur, Set, the red land, the desert of nature, Kemet. The same story of Akwesi Awusu and Aku Anansi. Akwesi Awusu or Awusi Awusu, Osar gets the fertile land, Anansi gets the desert. So the messenger, the trickster, operates with the planet Mercury, governor of the desert. All four qualities exist for the same deity in both cultures. Of course, we show that we're the first to show that in our publication. When you see a Nancy as a spider, that's the title for spider. Um, in, in the Akan language and so forth, you see a spider by a windowsill, come back a couple of days later, and you see they have woven in a web that fills up the entire empty space of the window, and they can move to any point in that empty space. They are the governor of every road of that empty space. In the same fashion, Anansi Kokroko, Anansi the great spider, weaves a web of tumi or divine power that permeates all of the black substance of space of creation, all of the planets, suns, moons, stars, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and Afurakani, Afurakani human life has a place on that web of energy. Anansi is the communicator between us and the Abosom and Insamafo and the Abosom and Insamafo and the Supreme Being to us. He's the navigator of that web. In your body, that worldwide web is the peripheral nervous system. And Anansi moves through as a messenger, moves through that web to bring messages to every part of the body. The endocrine system sends, governed by Awusi, Osar, sends messages or directives through hormonal secretions that are released into the bloodstream. 
and they reach, you know, those directives reach all the different parts of the body. Akwesi, or Awuku Anansi, sends messages throughout the body through electric signals that compel responses through the neurons and so forth that reach the different parts of the body. So the hormones send directives and the nervous system through electrical impulses and so forth, and messages through electrical impulses bring that compulsion. So this is why that compulsion, that generation of electromagnetic energy manifests as desire and set governs the desire and so forth. And if your desire becomes misguided, you become lustful and self-destructive. But if it's a harmonious desire, then you desire the things that keep you in harmony and so forth. Set is the messenger. Anansi is the messenger. So that worldwide web in your body is the peripheral nervous system. Regulate, once again, it's a regulatory force, a major regulatory force. Of course, nothing can take place within the body without the messenger, without the nervous system. So we show that in the article. We show the spider on the web. We show the nervous system, the connection between that, talking about the peripheral nervous system, which is the web. Okay, so the next piece, we're going to deal with the female abosome Akua, which is Nebethet, the wife of Awuku. She's called Agberu, the load bearer, the wife of Eshu. In Yoruba, she's Koni Koni, the wife of Legba and Vodun. Nebethet, the wife of seven ancient Kemet. You'll see in the chart that she governs the renal system. And that's, we go into a little bit more detail because people are not necessary, not always familiar with what goes on with respect to that. So she's a female force that operates at the planet Akua, which is Mercury, the female form of the name of the planet Mercury. So Awuku and Akua, set and head, govern the same planet. She's the divine courieress, the protectress, governess of ritual, and nurse mother. Set is the messenger. He carries the messages of prayers and invocations back and forth from the physical world to the spirit realm and the spirit realm back to the physical world. Akua, or Nebethet, is the divine courieress. She carries the offerings that we give, ritual offerings and so forth, which carry the energy that we're putting forward to the Abosom, to the Nsamafu, and carry their energy to us. This is why she wears the bowl on her head. The bowl is called kukua in Akan, an earthen vessel. In the Yoruba tradition, the wife of um, Eshu is called Agberu. She's called the courieress or the load bearer. The word Agberu means load bearer, which is the load that, vessel that's carried on the head of the Yoruba women. Agberu, the wife of Eshu, is the one who carries the offerings, the ritual offerings in her little basket and so forth, to the Orisha and the Agungun and so forth. Nebet Het has the vessel on her head. Neb or Nebet is a female vessel. And Het is the ritual enclosure, the structure, the house. So she has the vessel on her head. She's the load bearer. In Yoruba, she's called Akberu, the load bearer. In Akan, she's called Akua. A praise name of Akua is Kukua. And Kukua means a small earthen vessel. So in each tradition, the female divinity who's the courieress is literally called the vessel the low bearer and so forth, carrying the ritual offerings that we put forward that provoke the energy of the Abosom and the Nsamafo, Nananom and Samafo, the deities and ancestral spirits who are spiritually cultivated. So she's the courieress, protectress, governess of ritual, and nurse mother. Akura is the Abosom who governs the divine renal system, the fluid balancing and excretory structure of Abadie in creation, in the body of Nyamewa Nyame and the renal system within our bodies. She governs the excretory function of lactation, nursing, and the rain waters, which is lactation, of Asase Afua, the earth mother, and so forth. She nourishes the living and protects the spirits who transition to Asamando. The renal system, of course, is the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and so forth. But it's the fluid balancing. It's not just excretory, but it's the fluid, fluid balancing center of the body. So we show some of the, the symbolism and the function of the symbolism and what it means and the same names and titles in ancient Kemet. But then we show that vessel, the 
that she wears on her head that distinguishes Nebuchadnezzar from all other divinities. That vessel that she carries is the same vessel that you see um, within the body. You have two of those vessels in your body. They are the kidneys. Now, what do we say about, when we talk about rainwater and so forth, they talk about her being the nurse mother of Heru. Rainwater is a redistribution of resources on Asasia for the earth mother. The dry areas that are not close to the lakes, streams, rivers, and oceans derive a great benefit from this redistribution. Nebuchadnezzar or Akua governs that rainwaters and so forth. Plant life, animal life, mineral life, human life, Afurakani, Afurakani, human life, we, we benefit from that redistribution of water that comes from rainwater and so forth. The rains also assist in the swelling of rivers, streams, and lakes for the rebalancing of the water supply. The same function is executed by Nebethet, Akua, Agberu, Koni, Koni, within the Afurakani, Afurakani body as she functions through the renal system, whose major organ is the kidneys. The renal system not only functions as an excretory system and detoxifier of the blood, but also as the system which regulates electrolyte balance and fluid balance or water balance in the body, including the regulation of blood pressure. Electrolyte balance is mineral balance and so forth. The regulation of the fluid balance and electrolyte balance and mineral balance is nourishing while the excretion of waste and detoxification of the blood is restorative. These functions reflect the fertility and funerary functions of Nebuchadnezzar. And we go into some detail about that. We show the vessel on her head is the same as the vessel of one of the kidneys and so forth. We talk about her connected to the clouds, which are vessels that carry the rainwater. Talk about her being a funerary abosom as well. Talking about that restoration piece and protection ritually. We also talk about her governing, regulating. Uh, uh, she, she governs the Akuaba doll. The Akuaba is the ba, the child of Akua. That is the Ankh, N.H. Gamet. We continue to use that figure, that fertility figure, but it's used for fertility. But those Akuabadals are also used, they are male and female versions, that are also used for funerary purposes as well. So we show the different kinds of Akua, Akuabadals, Nkua, plural, um, there. Nkua is related to Nkua, which means Ankh. And Onkwa, Onku in ancient Kemet becomes Onkwa in Akam, meaning life. That's that fertility figure. We show that um, vessel on the head, the same structure you find in the traditional Akan, um, ritual figures and so forth. We show the connection with the Ankh. We go through some of that. We go through some of her titles. We want to get to another piece. Now, as the Abosom, who is the divine courieress, bearing a load on her head. So on earth, you see the funnel clouds and the great clouds that are carrying, holding that rainwater for the redistribution, the fluid balancing on earth. Then you have the kidneys who are holding the water for the fluid balancing in the body and the electrolyte balancing or the mineral balancing of the body. And of course, when it rains and the rivers swell, and there's a redistribution of water and so forth, and replenishment and so forth. And, uh, and the, the, of course, the earth is replenished and rejuvenated and so forth. That has to do with mineral balance as well. So the fluid balancing, water balancing, electrolyte balancing, mineral balancing on earth also is happening within the body because of the kidneys, those vessels. Um, of Akua, she's bearing the load on her head. She's the governess of our emotions. As we nourish ourselves, nutrients are distributed throughout our bodies based on the need of our organs and organ systems. The renal system filters our body and maintains fluid balance. As we absorb the energy streaming into us from our body of creation, harmonious energetic emanations from all aspects of creation are distributed throughout our spirit bodies based on the need of our spiritual organs and organ systems. Our core, Nebuchadnezzar, filters our spirit body and maintains spiritual fluid balance by excreting perverse, disharmonious, disordered vibrations and projections from disordered entities. Just like the renal system physically balances the water 
the fluids within your body, the mineral balance in your body, but also excrete toxins through the urinary process and so forth, gets rid of the toxins so you can be stable. Spiritually, when you're receiving all kinds of projections from creation, Akura receives those in her vessel, the spiritual kidneys and so forth, balances those energetic emanations from the forces in nature and other Afurakani, Afurakani people in plant life, animal life, and mineral life, but she also excretes the negative projections of disordered individuals and entities and so forth. That's the spiritual fluid balance. That's our emotional balance. Our emotional state is a reflection of our own spirit's energetic emanations interacting with, internalizing, and or rejecting the energetic emanations of entities of and within our body. So if you absorb perverse, disharmonious, energetic emanations from disordered entities, physical and non-physical, that leads to the perversion of our perception. We have not filtered properly because we have not rejected disorder. Thus our kukua or our basin on our head becomes a heavy load upon our heads. We become imbalanced, emotionally imbalanced. We're receiving and retaining disordered projections and emanations from perverse individuals, entities, ideas, and so forth, internalizing them, holding them, and we become emotionally unstable because we're not in harmony with our core. If, you're not in, if your renal system is not working properly, you're not excreting waste properly, then disease manifests. If you're in harmony with our core, you will uh, excrete negative projections and you'll only receive and redistribute uh, positive um, harmonious projections from nature as well as yeah, both them as well as Afurakani, Afurakani people. This is what we're dealing with, with with regard to the regulation of fluid balance and electrolyte balance, nutrient balance within the body, but also energetic projections and so forth. So the divine renal system within the great divine body is governed by Akua Nebethet as she operates through the planet Akua or so-called Mercury. All right. Now, we're going to get to the next piece, which is Yao on Yao Da, which is Thursday. Yao, this is Heru, the son of Osar and Oset, which is different from Heru, the son of Ra, which is Heru Bedeti. That's the difference between Yao and Benna. That's the difference between Shango and Ogun. That's the difference between Hebioso and Ogu. It's also the difference between Aro and Ikenga in the Igbo tradition. So Yao, the abosom of the planet Yao, which is so-called Jupiter. The term we talk about the term Yao meaning confrontational, aggressive, relentlessly challenging, discord, and so forth. He is the abosom of bravery and strength. He governs kingship and rulership. He governs the divine cardiovascular system, a governmental structure within a body of creation. The divine body of Nyamewa Nyame and just thus the cardiovascular system within the Afurakani Afurakani black body. We show how his name Yao is a title in ancient Kemet for Heru. He's called Heru Yao, which means confrontational, a fighter, a combatant, and so forth. He's called Yao in Aka. We show the term Heru becoming Horu and Shoru in Coptic. Shoru becomes Soru or Soro in Aka. Or Soro Yao comes from Horu Yao in ancient Kemet, same day. So we go through some of that linguistic information we show some more. We don't have to go through all of the linguistic piece here. So we'll, we'll scroll through some of that. So getting to the physical portion, Yao operates through the heart, the major organ of the cardiovascular system. So his, the seat is the heart, and, of course, that's part of that regulatory system, the cardiovascular system. The heart regulates order in the body, by releasing oxygen-filled blood in a measured fashion. Yao operates through the heart or core of all created things, the core of the Oriya, the sun, the solar core of Asasya for the earth. The heart, Akoma, is the drummer in the body. In Akan culture, the Ocherema, the drummer, is a regulator of order in society. 
Another term for drummer is ayan, yan, which is also related to ya and yao. The ayan or chine drum is sacred to ya. By comparison, in Yoruba culture, as well as Vodun, Shango, and Hevioso are recognized to be the Orisha and Vodou of the drum and master of the drum. This has residence for thunder is nothing more than the drumming of Yao, Shango, Hevioso, as the Abosom of thunder. We show the heart itself. We show the image of the heart in ancient Kemet, and we show the image of a drum, Achene, in Akan. There's a title of Heru called Heru, Ami Abu, Helu, Heru, dweller within Abu or dweller within hearts. The title of Heru in ancient Kemet. He is an Abosom of bravery and strength. In our Khan culture, the term Akokoduru defines one who is brave or has courage. Akoko, chest, and duru, weight, meaning the chest has weight. You have a stout chest, a heavy chest, strong chest, and so forth, meaning you have courage. And, of course, that term Heru, Ami Abu, an ancient command Heru, who dwells in hearts. That means somebody who has heart. Akokoduru, that's the title of Yao, the Abusum of bravery and so forth and strength. Seated in the heart. Now, Yao is the largest planet, or his planetary home is the largest planet, the king of the planet. He governs kingship and rulership, so the king of the planets is Yao, so called Yao Pater, or Pater Yao, or Father Yao, which is corrupted into Jupiter. But in Akan culture, it's called Yao, and H. Command as well, that term Yao the heaviest or largest planet, the king of the planets. It is the planetary home of Yah, while the core of the sun is the solar home of Yah. He's the core of things. He's the core of the sun, core of the earth, within the solar system, king planet or the core planet, the largest planet is the planetary home of Heru or Yah. You'll see that in that planet Yah, the great, great red spot is the same structure as the eye of Heru and so forth. We go into some detail about that. We show the connection of Wachet and Nekabet in connection with Yao and so forth. Um, we also show, you know, Aset and Heru and how they corrupted that into Mary and Jesus, the fictional cartoon characters who never existed, white or black. We go into some detail about that. But the key is the regulation through the heart and cardiovascular system. The heart pumps blood, the oxygen fills blood, but that blood carries a life force energy divine living energy, the ba or baet that comes from the creator and creatress, and yonkumpon and yonkumpon called ra and right and nature commit, the divine living energy moving through the bloodstream is regulated by heru through the palpitations of the heart. The heart will speed up when you need more blood, slow down when you, you, know, when you become calm and so forth, regulating the flow of blood is reg- and, and, and you know, sending that blood to the different organs and tissues and so forth. That's also regulating the flow of divine living energy, the ba and baet. Sending blood to the different organs is giving a blood sacrifice and energy contained within the blood. You, you're sending some blood or giving a blood sacrifice to each one of the organs of the shrines of the divinities when you speed up the heart and you're pumping extra blood and so forth to flood different organs and glands. That's a blood sacrifice, a blood offering to the shrines of the divinities within your body. So Heru is regulating um, order within the body by distributing divine living energy, not only the nutrients in the blood, but the divine living energy of Ron Riot, distributing it through the blood, through the palpitations, to the various aspects of the body. That's a regulatory function. All right, so we're going to get into uh, Yah, we're getting close to the end of the broadcast, and we're almost done. We just want to go through these last uh, four quickly. And all of these articles are on the Akronim Bosom page. When you look at Yah, she's the Abosom of the planet Yah, Uranus. Her day is Yada, Thursday is Yada. She's also one of the female forces operating through the planet Jupiter or Yao. But her planetary home is Yah or Uranus. We're the first to show that and prove that with regards to the Akradin Boson. 
which is referred to as fierce attacker relentlessly assailing disorder. She's the abosum of fighting and punishment. She's an abosum who is a protectress of royal sovereignty. Yah, along with her twin sister, Abba, governed the divine magnetosphere, a governmental structure preserving stability within the Abadie creation, the body of the supreme being, and thus the magnetosphere permeating Asasea for the earth mother and the Afurakani Afurakani body. Now we go into some detail about the names and the titles and so forth. We talk about the magnetosphere. We show the connection between Yah and Abba, which is Wachet and Nekabet and Ejikamet and their connection to Heru. But there's a couple of things we want to focus on here. Now, in this article, we focused on their manifestation, Yah and Abba or Wachet and Nekabet. Sometimes they're shown as the uh, cobra and the vulture on the forehead of the um, Ainsu of the sovereign. Sometimes they're shown as winged cobras. In the article, we show them in the form of winged cobras that serpent energy with the wings, which has to do with fanning the energy. Then we show the Smaitawi symbol, the plants of the north and south that are governed by Wachet and Negebet, the lung system and the fanning of the energy within the bronchial tubes, that tree. When you see the uh, plants of the north and south, those are the trees, the bronchial tubes within the lung structure, and the energy of fanning with the wings of the winged cobra serpents of Wachet and Nekabet um, contributes to that electromagnetic field when you're breathing and fanning in and out, expanding and contracting, not only taking in oxygen but solar energy and so forth, and you're expanding and contracting and fanning the flames of fire within your system, and you're helping to generate that magnetosphere through that, that expansion and contraction. So that serpent energy, that electromagnetic energy, that electromagnetic wave energy moving through your system, being fanned with the wings, fanning that electromagnetic energy, that's a generation of the magnetosphere within the body that surrounds the body, just like you have an electromagnetic field that surrounds the planet, various planets and the suns and moons and stars and so forth. We have electromagnetic field, and it is generated, manifest through when you're breathing in and out, generating that electromagnetic energy is being fanned. The flames of the divine life force energy moving through the blood are being fanned through the wave energy of the wings as symbolized with the bronchial tree and so forth, and you generate this field, this electromagnetic field. We focus on that, and in fact, we can do this at the same time for Yah and Abba, the book articles, um, Watch at the Nekabet. So we show that in the article when we talk about the electromagnetic field and the plants of the north and the south. We show the connection between that symbol and the lung structure, the heart and lung complex and the adinkra symbols. But then we want to get to, so that's when they are operating in the form of those winged cobras, fanning the flames of electromagnetic energy that generate an electromagnetic field operating through the trees within the lungs, the bronchial tube. But when they're operating as one is operating as the vulture and one is operating as the cobra on the forehead of the sovereign, then we get into a different manifestation. It's still connected, though. So when you look at the digestive system with Wachet, and what do you see when you see that digestive system? You see the tongue at the top that undulates like a serpent, and then you have the long esophagus that goes all the way down and gets into the stomach, and then eventually you see the uh, intestinal tract. We talk about the apep, the intestinal tract. We did a broadcast on apep. When you're talking about the tongue leading into the mouth and the uh, esophagus going down into the stomach and so forth, that is a great elongated cobra or serpent inside your body. That is Wachet when she's manifesting as the serpent on the head of the sovereign and then Nekabet 
um, is manifesting as the vulture, which we're about to get into. Notice how serpents or cobras or pythons, when they're consuming food and so forth, they simply swallow the entire animal whole and it moves through that long body and so forth and it begins to be broken down by the gastric juices and so forth in that serpent. And the same thing is similar to your esophagus. You have your tongue, which is that undulating movement like a serpent. You swallow the food and it moves through the serpentine body of the esophagus and gets into the stomach and then it's broken down by the gastric acid and so forth. You have that serpent there and it begins to remove the nutrients and take the energy, the fire, the fuel that is manifest, the consumption of the food. You generate some food. You generate some fuel. That's part of that process. Now, you look at Abba or Nekabet, and we say that's the respiratory system. We're talking about the regulatory function now. You have the great serpent inside of your body, the esophagus reaching up out of the mouth and swallowing whole, you know, the prey. And then taking um, energy out of that, what has been swallowed, and generating fuel or fire from the burning of that fuel. Now you look at Nekabet, who manifests as the great vulture. And if you look at the lung structure, and if you look at the vulture with the wings folded down, the protective nature of the lung tissue on the outside. We're not talking about the bronchial tubes on the inside with the winged cobra manifestation. We're talking about the tissue of the lungs on the outside. Um, that is the great vulture. And then, of course, you see the trachea and you see the head of the vulture and the long neck of the vulture coming out of the trachea and so forth. But you see the little vulture sitting inside your chest with the great wings folded down, the lung tissue and so forth. And you see the, you know, throat and the long neck of the vulture, the quote-unquote buzzard and so forth, uh, sticking out. So the fanning of the wings, the expansion and the contraction of the lungs, that has to do with the expansion and contraction of the air that's being moving, moving through the lungs and the life force energy that's within the air in concert with the fuel that's generated from the food that you consume and once the nutrients are consumed and the fire is released from that fuel that you're generating by consumption, that body heat and so forth, the heat, the fire generated through consumption, digestion from wachet, and then the fanning of that energy through the lung tissue that's governed by that great vulture sitting in the chest, that's the combination of those regulatory functions as serpent and vulture that generate the magnetosphere, the magnetic field, and they also operate within the bronchial tubes as uh, winged cobras as well. So there's two manifestations of them, internally and externally. So we go into some detail about that there, um, but that's the connection between Wachet dealing with the digestive system as a regulatory function and uh, Nekabet or Abba dealing with the respiratory function, the great vulture sitting in the chest, fanning the flames of the divine ba or by divine living energy. So the last two is Afi and Amen Men, which is Het Heru and Amen Men. Now on the internal piece you have we talk about Het Heru and let's pull this up right quick. We did it recently. I did a um, broadcast going through some details about Afi, different manifestations of Het Heru in our different titles and so forth. We talk about Afi is the one who governs, the Abosom governs the sensual attraction, which is the precursor to sexual activity, procreative activity, and that which replenishes its harmony, which is pleasure. Afi governs that divine reproductive system, the procreative, creative structure, talking about the procreative portion aspect of it, fallopian tools and so forth, epididymis in the male, in Abadiye, the divine body of Nyamewa Nyame, 
and thus the reproductive system within the Afrakani Afrakani body. She governs the fallopian tubes in the female, epididymis in the male. She also governs part, a partial of that gestation process from the first the sperm and um, ovum unite within the fallopian tubes, which is the house head of Heru and so forth. Now, systematically, as a human body system, we deal with the exocrine system. So let's look at this is something that a lot of people are not too focused on. So we talked about the endocrine glands, which are ductless glands that secrete hormones into the bloodstream. The exocrine glands are glands that produce and secrete substances onto an epithelial surface by way of a duct. So the endocrine glands are ductless. They release the hormones directly in the bloodstream. No ducts, no tubes, and so forth. The exocrine glands have tubes or ducts, and they release the substances on a surface. um, epithelial uh, surface by way of the duct. Examples of exocrine glands include sweat, salivary, mammary, um, and other glands. Now, let's pull this up right quick. You can see a chart with the different exocrine glands. We don't have to go through all of them. I just wanted to pull up, hold on one second. I think we had, okay, we had something pulled up. Um, it's not pulling up, so give me a second. Give me one second. All right. Okay. So, exocrine system, some of the glands, sweat glands, uh, secrete sweat located in the dermis of the skin, salivary, uh, mammary glands, milk producing glands of the female, prostate, the semen producing gland of men, um, the sebaceous gland, the small gland in the skin, which secretes an oily substance that lubricates the skin and hair. Um, mucus substance used for lubrication and protection. Those are different things. They, uh, secretions lead ultimately to the exterior of the body, so the inner surface of the glands and the ducts that drain them are similar to the skin. That's a major piece. Um, there was one other portion. Okay. We just want, um, it was one other portion I wanted to make sure we got. Okay, for example, the sebaceous glands are found throughout all areas of the skin except the palms and hands and soles of the feet. Two types of sebaceous glands, those connected to hair follicles. Um, Sebaceous glands are found in hair-covered areas where they are connected to hair follicles. One or more glands may surround each hair follicle, and the glands themselves are surrounded by erective pili muscles. Now, Sebaceous glands are also found in hairless areas of the eyelids, nose, the phallus, labia minora, inner mucosal membrane of the cheek, and nipples, and so forth. They talk about, we want to get to this piece because it's directly related to head heru. So when she's releasing fluids, when we're talking about head heru, the central attraction, that force, the central attraction, that's the precursor to procreative activity. She's the one that draws the male and female together in a harmonious union, pulls us together. Then physically, we're drawn together spiritually. Then we're drawn together physically through marriage and so forth. We're drawn together through copulation. The male organ, female organ is drawn together in a harmonious fusion. Of course, the sebaceous glands and so forth um, are part of that process with regards to the release of fluids so the male and female can engage in copulation and so forth. Then the sperm cell enters into the vaginal tract um, through the vulva and so forth. The vulva is governed by heteru. 
goes into the fallopian tubes, which is a structure governed by Het Heru, and this is why it's Het Heru, the house of Heru, the house of that bird, the sacred bird, the falcon, which is the fertilized ovum and so forth. The sperm reaches the ovum and penetrates and fuses within the house of Heru, the Het Heru, within the fallopian tube. That's another fusion. So first she brings us together as two people, Akurakani, Akurakani, male and female. We're drawn together spiritually, drawn together through marriage. Then we're drawn together physically, drawn together through copulation. Then the sperm and ovum are drawn together. She's constantly fusing together in order of fusion, complementary opposites and, and harmony, fusing together the sperm and ovum in that process. And then, of course, um, gestation begins after that. Every, internally, she's, you know, in the fallopian tubes and so forth. Externally, that, that uh, integumentary system, which is the skin and, and the exocrine system, which is dealing with the glands that are releasing these fluids that allow us to facilitate these aspects of copulation, union, fusion, all these different things, whether it's salivary glands, mammary glands, um, the glands connected to the uh, prostate, the re dealing with the semen and so forth, the release of lubricant for the vulva and so forth, as well as the vagina. All these different things are happening that have to do with that central attraction that's the precursor to procreative, procreative activity and the replenishment of its harmony, replenishment of that procreative activity, that order fusion is harmony. Harmony is just the manifestation of order. And we talked about that in the piece dealing with Het Heru. So um, the, that broadcast was with Het Heru, but the key is Internally, she's governing the, the fallopian tubes that fuse together in order of fusion, the sperm and ovum. Externally, she's governing that, that regulatory system that facilitates that attraction and fusion and so forth is manifest through the exocrine glands and all the different functions that lead to that uh, central attraction and order of fusion. Okay, and the final piece, we only have a couple of minutes left in the show, so... For those, if you can't stay on, if you want to stay on beyond 11.30, you must get on the phone um, within the next 90 seconds. The phone number is 646-787-8155, 646-787-8155. You have about a little bit over a minute to get on. If you don't get on the phone now, then only the people who are on the phone will hear and it will cut off as far as the people who are just listening online. If you can't stay on beyond 11.30, and we only have a few minutes left anyway, so we won't go too much into overtime, but uh, we posted an OCOM Economic Development Model Assessment um, on our website, a $5 Black Business Challenge, Starve the Beast and Feed the Pride. We already had a couple of people who did the challenge today, and we appreciate that. Yet I say we thank you. We are working to complete the filming process um, of our documentary film within the next 30 days, but we need to reach that 100%. We, we have just moved from 48% to 50% over the past um, few days with regards to the crowdfunding effort. Over the past year, we've had about 14 contributions per month, which is like 170 contributions um, in 12 months. At the same time, we've had about four thousand downloads per month of our free books, fifty five thousand in a year. We said what is the disconnect? That is the Ocom economic development model answers that question. If we have fourteen contributors on a monthly basis, but four thousand books being downloaded on a monthly basis, then the disconnect comes from we have not fully embraced that Ocom economic development model. When we study that, we can see the disconnect. People can make adjustments and so forth. We start starving the beast and feeding the pride, supporting black businesses on a regular basis and making a deliberate effort to do so. We choose one black business per week for 52 weeks for optimal capital infusion, and then we direct resources to that business in the next week, the next business, the next week, the next business, and so forth. This is what we do in the Ocom economic development model. The first is the philosophical foundation rooted in our ancestral religious values, 
that allows us to perceive properly so we no longer have a desire to support our enemies. We always have a natural inclination propensity to support our businesses first when we can and where we can. And if we have to support the White Snarl Spring for certain um, items, then we do that. But when we have the opportunity to support our businesses that will empower our people in some fashion, then we are naturally inclined to do so and we utilize that strategy, starve the beast to feed the prize and feed the prize. So we have this five dollar black business challenge. This is for individuals who have not yet had the opportunity or been had the capacity yet to support the crowdfund for our film. Um, we've had about a hundred people contribute with 170 contributions because some of the 100 people contributed more than once, some twice, some three times, even a few contributed like five times. So we've had about 100 people. However, as we said before, we have 14 contributions per month, over 4,000 downloads of our books on a monthly basis. So we are reaching people, 55,000 downloads of our books over the past 12 months, 12 month period. So we are definitely reaching people. People contact us on a regular basis, stating how the books have transformed their lives, whether it's dietary or social or becoming entrepreneurs or transforming the lives of their children and relationships and so forth. So we are reaching people, but that disconnect can be resolved simply through embracing our ancestral culture. If you've not yet had an opportunity or had the capacity at the time to participate in supporting the crowdfund for those individuals. If you've benefited from the books over the past four years since we started releasing the soft cover publications in volume, then starve the beast and feed the prize. Take that $5 challenge and think about if you would have spent a dollar for Arizona iced tea every day this week, Monday through Friday at work, that would have been $5 at the end of the week. You can reallocate that $5 this particular week to the crowdfund, we've had 100 people over the past um, year. This is the 52nd week of the crowdfund. We just posted, um, and we, we, we were at 50% of our progress. Our goal is 16,000. We're at 8,000 right now. We, we passed that mark. We got to that in a year, in 52 weeks. We saw and we posted this on our website there was a black person in the school. He wanted the kids in the school to see the movie Black Panther. So he put out a, like a GoFundMe campaign to help generate money to raise tickets to see the movie Black Panther. They generated over $30,000 in five days. Now, of course, the cracker Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, these two white individuals are the ones who created Black Panther, it's a fictional tale about fictional superheroes and so forth. These are millionaires who will be receiving hundreds of millions of dollars from black people. For those who do not know, they have a lesbian relationship between the black female superheroes that they will be showcasing in the film. This is the only reason the film is being produced, to promote homosexuality, dissexuality in our population. You have millions of black people waiting on the edge of their seats to give crackers millions of dollars. And what you receive in return when you bring all your children from all over the country all to rush to see this movie, and they get all excited about the martial arts, but they're also normalizing bisexuality, lesbianism. That is the only reason the movie is being made. So people are going to spend millions of dollars to have their children indoctrinated. They're going to get so excited about seeing black characters. And that excitement is going to be infused with an acceptance of this sexuality, homosexuality from the youngest age. We don't need to support our enemies using our own people to brainwash our own people. So instead of, but again, they raised $30,000 in five days to give to crack. Now, we've raised $8,000 in uh, 12 months with just 100 people. But, of course, they've had, you know, they raised $30,000 because a bunch of people jumped in because they just want their children to see this movie. It's so important to give white millionaires 
millions more dollars to brainwash our people to force this sexuality, the sexual agenda on our people. So we need movies that are dealing with real superheroes, not superheroes, but superheroes. And superheroes are ancestresses and ancestors who use our divination systems to guide us towards waging war against the whites and our offspring and freeing us from enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. The reason we're sitting here physically able to walk around without chains on is because our real superheroes and superheroes actually used our own divination systems as guidance to wage war effectively. That's what our people need to be watching, not giving all our money to our enemies, the whites and offspring, to promote this sexuality. So if you support the work we do and you haven't had a chance in the past few years, if you've ever downloaded a book, if it's worth $5 to you or $10 or something like that over the past four years since we started putting the soft cover books out in volume, if it's valuable to you, then please support the crowdfund. We can reach the other 40 or 50% of our goal literally in one day. If 100 people or 14 contributions a month the people who are downloading the thousands of books every single month, if just 10% of them, 400 of those people made a contribution, we would have had the, you know, the funding there in one day immediately. So, but we still have, there are at least hundreds of people out of the 4,000 per month who download the books who never had a chance to contribute. Think about what funds you may have spent with the whites this week on something that you may have not really needed if you really think about it, and take that $5 challenge. It doesn't have to be five. It could be more. Somebody did five today. Somebody did 10 today. So whatever, you know, amount you can contribute, we say, yeah, I'll say we thank you because we would like to complete the film in the the next 30-day process once we reach that goal and have the film out before the beginning of spring, before March 20th, 21st. And we can meet that obligation, but we do need the assistance of the community. Okay, so we're going to, the last piece is the divinity, Amen Men. And if you look at the article, Amen Men, on the website, He's referred to as the ancient one, governs the planet, Amini. Today is Miminida, Saturday of Saturn, called Heru Kapet, Heru the great bull of heaven in ancient Kemet. The planet Saturn is also also called Seba Amin, which is the star of the Amin or West, the Western star. This is why he's called Amini. And Amen Men in our Khan culture is called the deity Men or Amen Men in Egypt Kemet. He is the Abosom of creation, ancient one, defender of the past. He's an elder repository of ancestral tradition and protocol, governs the divine axis or central nervous system, a regulatory structure within our body of creation, the divine body of Nyame Wat Nyame, and thus the axis central nervous system, brain, and spinal column within the Afurakani, Afurakani body. And when you look at the brain and spinal column, they call that the central nervous system. If you look at the term Amimini, that is one of the terms for brain in the Akan language, look at the crown of Amimin in ancient Kemet. He has a crown like a skull cap and then a ribbon hanging from the back of the head all the way down to the ground. Egyptologists never understood what that symbol was, we are the first to prove exactly what that crown is. It's the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal column. That is the crown of Amen Men, which they never understood because they didn't know that Amen Men is named for brain and also the name of the deity, also the name of the planet in the Akan tradition, as well as ancient Kemet and so forth. But when we talk about an overall system inclusive of the brain and spinal column, um, what governs that brain and spinal column, of course, is the skull and the vertebrae and the entire skeletal system. So when you see that crown, you see the central nervous system. When you see that mummified wrapping of amen men, divinity men, and he's, it's a phallic, 
meaning he has an erect phallus constantly inseminating creation. He's the great bull of heaven, Heru Kapet, Ka meaning bull, also Ka meaning phallus. He's also inseminating the great cow, the great Kaet of creation, which is Het Heru, who's called Men Menit in this capacity. Kaet means cow, it also means soul, it also means vagina. So Ka and Kaet are the male and female terms for soul, Ka and Kaet are the male and female terms for bull and cow, Ka and Kaet are the male and female terms for phallus and vagina, governed by men and Het Heru, or Amen Men and Men Menit. He's called Orisha Oko, and she's called Oshun Ibu Dioko, the wife of Oko in Yoruba, Azaka and Erzuli in Vodou. Now, in Kemet, Amen Men is called Men. He's depicted in mummy form. He's enshrouded. That's talking about preservation in that white, you know, mummified form. He preserves through that mummified form intact our cultural order, our amambre, our culture. He enshrines or crystallizes our traditions. When one is mummified, they're impervious to decay. He's enshrining, preserving, crystallizing our traditions, protocol. He's the great elder and all of that. He's shown erect, as we said, constantly impregnating creation, um, the bull of heaven, inseminating the great cow, which is Het Heru. Here's the other key piece, and that's why they call him in our Khan culture the ever ready shooter, Atua Poma, and so forth. Our Khan academics thought that meant he was meant he was battle ready. He's already ready to shoot because they didn't understand the cosmology. The ever ready shooter, Atua Poma, and so forth, really means the one who is constantly shooting or inseminating the great cow. He's it's a phallic shown with the erect phallus, constantly inseminating, fertilizing creation. That's why he's the ever-ready shooter and so forth. That's what it actually means. But also with regard to that enshrining, that white um, mummy form and so forth, and of course he's wearing all white in the Orisha tradition. He's one of the Orisha Fun Fun of the quote-unquote white Orishas, meaning the sacred color and the foods and so forth are white. Um, it's the same thing. It's talking about that enshrining of culture, that elder or elder status, just like the white hair and so gray hair and so forth, that enshrining of, of ancestral pro- protocol. But here's the other key with regard to that. Enshrining that ancestral protocol on the physical body, you're talking about the enshrining of all of the organs and systems and everything else. That's what the skeletal system does. Now, our people always understood that. So that enshrining force, that skeletal system force, um, is connected to amen men in that capacity. Of course, his crown is the brain and spinal column, which is the central nervous system, the divine axis, the polar axis as a regulatory structure. But then we also show that even though he's, you know, enshrouded and presiding uh, or enshrining protocol and crystallizing traditions and so forth and preserving them as an elder, he's also isophallic. So if he's enshrouded with that white mummy form, we're talking about the skeletal system that's protecting all the organs and systems and so forth, maintaining their integrity, but he's also how is that also related to fertility? In ancient Kemet, it's related to fertility because he's the major force, the male force of fertility in connection with Heteru, the female force of fertility. In Akan culture, it's the same thing, and all the titles refer to that, the ever-ready shooter, the, the elder, the one who preserves protocol and tradition and so forth. So what is the relationship between the skeletal system that enshrines protocol and elderhood and, and crystallization of traditions, but also male fertility. So if you look, for example, Silent Science Daily, um, our article that was published a few, few years ago and has been uh, commented on and expanded upon since this research, 
the date February 18, 2011, the title, Male Fertility is in the Bones, First Evidence that Skeleton Plays a Role in Reproduction. So they show an image of a skeleton. Researchers have found an altogether unexpected connection between a hormone produced in the bone and male fertility. The study shows that the skeletal hormone known as osteocalcin boosts testosterone production to support the survival of the germ cells that go on to become mature sperm. So the skeletal system is directly related to male fertility, which they just discovered, but our people have been directly dealing with that as I mean men, the deity that governs male fertility We've always known who he is, and we invoke him for that purpose. And if somebody is infertile, a male, they invoke this divinity to, so that they can become fertile. So we know exactly who he is and what his function is, and we show his function through his symbolism and so forth. So we know exactly what we're talking about. They just discovered this and published it um, seven years ago. They say, until now, interactions between the bone and reproductive system have focused only on the influence of gonads on the build on the buildup of bone mass. Talking about the testes and the buildup of bone mass. Since communication between two organs in the body is rarely one way, the fact that the gonads regulate bone really begs the question, does bone regulate the gonads, said this particular doctor. They found their clue. Investigators then did several experiments to show that osteocalcin enhances the production of testosterone, a sex steroid hormone controlling male fertility. Now, here's another key. The skeleton regulates male fertility, but not female. Remarkably, although the new findings stem from an observation about estrogen and bone mass, because the gonads contribute to bone mass and so forth, testosterone and estrogen, the researchers could not find any evidence that the skeleton influences female reproduction. Estrogen is considered one of the most powerful hormones that control bone. When ovaries stop producing estrogen in women, after menopause, bone mass rapidly declines and can lead to osteoporosis. Sex hormones, namely estrogen in women and testosterone in men, have been known to affect skeletal growth, but until now, studies of the interaction between bone and the reproductive system have focused only on how sex hormones affect the skeleton. They say, we do not know why the skeleton regulates male fertility and not female. So this is why men, I mean men, is mummified and it's a phallic, but Head Heru isn't shown typically as mummified. He's shown regulating the skeletal system. He's it's a phallic showing that the skeletal system facilitates male fertility, but on the other side, she's not typically shown as um, mummified and so forth, but she is the female divinity of female fertility. In the same process, and we put this in the book, which is coming forward with regard to Abena. When we talk about Abena and Obwadie, or Sekhmet and Pata, and there's a marriage between Pata and Sekhmet, and Pata is at the core of earth on the male side, and Sekhmet is at the core of earth on the female side. We said Sekhmet governs the lymphatic system. Pata governs the brain structure, including the cerebral cortex. This is part of our culture. There's a marriage. They're married. Pata and Sekhmet, they give birth to Nefertim, another divinity. So the lymphatic system and the brain structure that formulates thoughts, ideas, and so forth, the formative structure in the body within the brain, they're married. So, of course, we've always understood that for thousands of years. The whites in their offspring just a few years ago, by accident, they reported in their scientific journals that they discovered Discovered a lymphatic system within the brain. Prior to that, over the past 100 plus years, all of the books on anatomy, which they thought they had mapped out the human anatomy totally for the past 100 years, never knew that there was a lymphatic structure in the brain. They thought it stopped around the neck and that was it. Because they were studying mice and doing some other experiments, they stumbled across the lymphatic structure in the brain, and now all of the books on human anatomy that have been written over the past 100 years have to be rewritten 
because they discovered this new lymphatic structure in the brain. That is the union of Sekhmet, the lymphatic structure married to Pata in the brain structure, which is part of our cosmology and is common knowledge amongst all Afrakani, Afrakani people, youth as well as adults, because we teach them about the marriage of um, Sekhmet and Pata. But this is a new discovery for the whites and offspring. Very often when they're looking for new discoveries, they'll look at the cosmology of our culture and then look for clues and then find those clues and then publish them as though they're discovered. But this is just to show that this information we've always had and it's woven into our culture, so we live it. It's not a belief or a discovery. It's something that is lived. Okay, so it is... Um, so that was the last piece. We already are way into overtime. We are going to end the broadcast here. If you have any questions or comments, just send us a link, um, you know, send us a message and so forth via email. We're trying to catch up with the various messages that we have. So just um, be, be a little bit patient. We're trying to catch up with all the emails that we get. Um, of course, we'll be posting this broadcast, the related books and so forth. We have the 11 articles. We have Volume 1 and Volume 2. These articles that you see on the 11 Cardine Bosome, not only will all of the information in those articles be included in the books, but in addition, a lot more information will be included as well. So those are just summaries, snapshots of what will be in the book. As you see in Volume 1 and Volume 2, you see the detailed information there. All the other volumes will be the same, and we plan to finish that entire series this year of 13,018. So we'll have the entire set. Right now we have Volumes 1 and 2. Volume 3 is almost done, um, which can be done within the next few weeks. Um, and then Volumes 4, 5, and 6 over the next few months. So we'll have the entire series of Akradi and Bosom out. But again, if you have any questions about that, or any of the information, just uh, send us an email. But once again, we are trying to get the film done. We've been at this for a year with regard to the funding, but we've also been having our conferences. We released like five books last year, working on this third Akradine Boson volume. We have the Hopi Meta Retreat coming up in four weeks, and we still have a couple of spaces, so if you would like to um, attend that, go directly to the page. We have our Etchy Sign Conference coming up in March. So we have a number of things coming up, but the primary piece is we do, well, first and foremost, we do have to, you know, the uh, retreat is coming up right away in the next few weeks, actually four weeks from now. But at the same time, we're trying to get the film done within the next 30 days, the completion of the film, filming piece, and then we go through the editing process so we can have it ready in March. So by the spring equinox, so we just need the assistance of the community. Those people who have the capacity starve the beast and feed the pride, take that $5 challenge. Once you do so and you show and you do so and you share it with other people, you can share with them in the context of saying, listen, I just did the $5 challenge or I did 10 or 15 or whatever I did. I did this. Here's how I did it. You can do the same thing. What very often happens is we'll put a challenge out and people share it and it may have four or five or 600 shares and we have about two people who actually did the challenge, but we have about 600 shares. And that's how things go on social media. People are just used to sharing and liking and sending. But when it actually comes to activating, that gets lost in the mix because they assume that the next person is going to activate, operate, and the next person assumes the next person is going to do so. And at the end of the day, if you look at the, over the course of the, even with regard to this over the past year, but even other things, and other business owners know this as well, Typically, 95, 96, 97 plus percent of the people simply like and share because they assume that the next person is going to participate. And at the end of the day, you look over the course of a year, and 96, 97 percent of the people never actually participate. So you do so, operate, take the challenge yourself, and then show people you actually did it, and then share. When they see you did it, they're likely to follow suit and do the same thing and participate first and then share. They make the contribution first and then share. 
Again, we can get to our goal within uh, a day, literally. All the people we have on Facebook, all the 4,000 downloads on a monthly basis, we can easily get to that point. So, again, Yedase, we thank you for tuning into the broadcast. We will be back on tomorrow for our 300th broadcast. So that's a special broadcast. And, again, Yebeshi Abiel, we will meet again. Good